Okay, guys, let's start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, uh, short course uh, about generally base isolation. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly? If uh, any one of you can uh, just okay, thank you, thank you very much. So I just briefly introduce myself. I am uh, Marco Furinghetti. I'm currently uh, assistant professor at the University of Pavia, uh, together with the uh, EU Center Foundation which is actually um, a foundation uh, in Italy uh, about uh, generally um, seismic risk. Uh, and uh, it has uh, a number of activities uh, about uh, the reduction of seismic risk uh, for any, um, any kind of uh, structural systems. So this short course uh, will uh, focus on uh, uh, generally seismic isolation. And so this means that uh, we will start with a brief introduction uh, and uh, then we will go through the details uh, for, from both the experimental and the numerical uh, standpoints uh, of uh, seismic isolation. Um, so my goal, my final goal for this, uh, uh, for this course uh, will be to provide you to some uh, uh, useful uh, tools uh, which allows you to know, uh, to better know uh, what generally is uh, performed from the experimental um, activities point of view, and also to provide some uh, useful uh, fast design rules uh, for uh, the um, uh, base isolation systems uh, for buildings and generally seismic isolation for also other um, structural systems. So, uh, we will do uh, a lot of things actually, and uh, we we will try also to uh, to manage uh, numbers uh, because uh, I don't want you to have just theory uh, in this course, but I want you to practice uh, also. Uh, but uh, uh, don't worry, we will do uh, uh, we will do it together. Uh, so I will show how to do that, and don't, and then uh, you can also practice uh, during the course uh, and obviously uh, later on. And uh, um, as I mentioned uh, in the in the email I sent to you, uh, this short course is uh, completely free. And uh, as uh, you have preferred uh, in the previous inquiry, uh, it it will be held uh, totally online uh, through this platform. The the connection link will not change uh, uh, for all the days. Uh, and um, the time schedule is uh, two hours per day for uh, these uh, two weeks. Uh, but the uh, Wednesdays, uh, to, uh, the two Wednesdays that uh, we have a uh, four day, uh, four hours, uh, sorry. And uh, this is mainly because uh, uh, on Wednesdays uh, for, for, this, uh, uh, for this weekend, the next one, uh, I will um, provide some numerical laboratory. Uh, so this means that we will use uh, actually some, uh, uh, some software. So this is why uh, I asked you to fill uh, the first inquiry about uh, generally your knowledge about uh, seismic isolation and also your uh, programming skills in MATLAB uh, rather than uh, the usage of uh, sub 2000. And then we will discuss later on the results uh, which are obviously uh, normalized. And uh, um, I also provide uh, some tools uh, uh, just to let you um, compute some, uh, um, some strategies uh, for both modeling and design uh, um, seismic isolation, uh, just even with, a, um, with an Excel spreadsheet. So they're very fast rules, uh, uh, very easy to, uh, easy to use uh, so that uh, you will be able uh, anyway to, uh, to consider them uh, also if uh, your programming skills in MATLAB are not so uh, so high, so uh, we will do it uh, in a very easy and simple way. Okay, um, uh, I want you to consider uh, this uh, course uh, in the and the generally lectures uh, in the most direct uh, possible. Uh, so this means that uh, whenever you uh, you are not um, understanding something that I mean, I'm I'm. Uh, I'm discussing, please interrupt me and ask me questions. Um, you should be also able to activate your video and your audio, uh, but uh, it is not necessary to uh, you to activate uh, the, the webcam. So you, you can just activate uh, the webcam when you have to ask uh, or just activate your, your audio, uh, your microphone uh, in order to ask the questions. So please feel free 
to ask whatever you want uh, because I, I, I really want to uh, deliver the message and uh, you to want to clearly understand what uh, we are uh, we will be uh, discussing in this uh, in this course and finally um, at the end of this uh, uh, this day uh, after this lecture I will create uh, a sharing folder in uh, Google Drive uh, and uh, then I will send the invitation to you uh, to your um, actually email addresses uh, so that we will can we will be able to share uh, material uh, and actually uh, first of all presentations that uh, I will deliver but also maybe um, some uh, research articles uh, which are directly related to, uh, to the topic and then and then uh, to the topics uh, covered in the in the short course uh, and maybe also some uh, um, computations that we will do uh, through maybe Excel and, and so on. So I think that uh, if uh, there is uh, no question about the generally the uh, these uh, let's say organization uh, aspects, uh, we can just start and uh, I start sharing my uh, my screen. Okay. So the title of uh, this uh, course is Experimental Assessment and Numerical Modeling on Seismically Isolated uh, Structural Systems. So again, uh, I will focus on both uh, the experimental assessment. So uh, in the first week, we will see uh, what, what is uh, assumed as uh, experimental assessment uh, according to which standards that we have to carry out experimental assessments of uh, generally um, uh, seismic devices. And then the second week, uh, but we will mix uh, obviously information uh, during the whole duration of the, um, of the course. We will also focus on numerical modeling. And uh, we, don't want, uh, we don't want to um, carry out numerical modeling uh, with uh, very detailed models uh, of uh, structures, but uh, what I want you to use uh, is uh, just a very simplified model, but which, uh, uh, generally returns a very, um, very uh, results very close, I mean, uh, to the real, uh, the real behavior of the structural systems. Um, according to seismic isolation, uh, we can use uh, uh, some simplifications uh, because uh, uh, for what we are going to see in this presentation, uh, there are some behaviors uh, which leads to simplifications. And actually uh, we have observed uh, uh, generally in the experimental campaigns that we have carried out on both the, the local level of isolators and then generally structures, uh, that these simplifications, uh, these first hypotheses are uh, actually, uh, provides actually fair um, representations of the real behavior. So again, uh, this is uh, just, uh, uh, a set of links uh, of myself. Uh, there is obviously my email address uh, and uh, you will be uh, free also to ask uh, questions uh, not only during the course, but uh, we can also uh, consider um, cooperations uh, um, during uh, also uh, your uh, PhD, uh, your PhD uh, duration. There is a link uh, at my ResearchGate profile so that uh, you will uh, you will be able to actually deepen the uh, details of the topics uh, uh, through my actually research uh, activity. Uh, I I've also created a YouTube channel where I load uh, generally uh, presentations uh, of uh, some works uh, that uh, I have presented in previous uh, conferences. But there is a, a video which uh, I uh, suggest you to uh, to see. Uh, it is quite long because it is three hours, uh, but it is uh, because uh, uh, it is so long uh, because uh, uh, it was a webinar that I have just organized uh, last March with uh, uh, on base isolation, generally seismic isolation, uh, with uh, some experts uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, which uh, uh, the first one, which is the the, the most famous, uh, is uh, my Professor Michael Constantino, which is uh, a pioneer. Uh, on uh, seismic isolation uh, generally worldwide. Uh, just consider, if you don't know it, uh, that um, the friction pendulum uh, technology has been invented by him uh, in the United States. So uh, he has a very important knowledge about seismic isolation. Uh, he has uh, um, 
a wide practice uh, um, about uh, seismic isolation uh, and uh, generally uh, he deals with very large structures, uh, for instance, offshore uh, and the nuclear plants. Uh, so uh, we will see, I will show also in this presentation uh, um, some examples of the huge devices uh, that uh, he has designed for, uh, for these particular uh, applications. And uh, um, actually in that presentation, in that webinar, you will see uh, a big picture of its, uh, of his, uh, uh, I mean, uh, of his um, practice, uh, practical um, activities. And um, um, there is also a presentation by myself uh, uh, and I, I show in that webinar the um, activities, uh, research activities uh, and also commercial activities that we carry out uh, in the EO Center Foundation where there is actually uh, a testing setup uh, dedicated to um, seismic isolators. Um, and then there is also uh, uh, there, there are also other contributions uh, from uh, Professor Virginio Quaglini uh, from Politecnico di Milano in Italy, uh, who is uh, um, an expert uh, uh, on uh, seismic uh, um, isolators uh, and uh, specifically for friction pendulum devices, so sliding devices. Uh, uh, he has developed uh, a number of uh, uh, innovative sliding materials, and we will discuss uh, these issues uh, later on. And also Professor Pavese from University of Pavia and the Center Foundation, uh, who is uh, actually in the, within the committee uh, in charge of the modification of the standard code about the anti-seismic devices. And this standard code will be discussed by, um, by me uh, tomorrow uh, in the lecture of tomorrow for this uh, short course. And um, I will show also uh, another video which is contained uh, within my, my channel, uh, which is actually the presentation of uh, the uh, laboratory setup uh, testing equipment for anti-seismic devices. Uh, um, what I want you to try to use uh, in this uh, uh, first week of, uh, um, of short course is uh, also the data reduction procedure for uh, real uh, experimental data. So I will provide you within Wednesday uh, some, uh, uh, some files containing uh, uh, data returned by exper real experimental um, tests on the full scale devices. So generally they are returned by um, uh, contracts uh, which are related to uh, commercial activities. So they are actually real practice uh, applications. And uh, you will be able to manage those data, and uh, we will try to um, uh, actually to practice uh, what we learn from the theory uh, jointly with uh, the uh, standard code, the European one uh, for anti seismic devices, and then by using actually the experimental data. And finally, there is also the link for uh, your center foundation uh, for you to have uh, just a very uh, brief overview of uh, uh, all the activities. Uh, which are carried out at that uh, important research work. So just a very big picture of what, what uh, you have uh, um, set in the, the initial inquiry. Uh, this is the, the final result uh, uh, over 17 uh, uh, answers. Uh, and uh, actually this is uh, uh, regarding the knowledge about seismic isolation at the moment. So generally, the average of this uh, distribution, uh, assume, by assuming that it is a normal Gaussian uh, distribution, uh, which is uh, actually simplifying a lot this uh, bar plot, but uh, actually the, also the, the, statistical, um, the, stati uh, the statistical set of data is, uh, um, is not so wide. Uh, the average is five, so this means that the um, that there is no so much background about seismic isolation. And uh, for, for what concerns uh, the, the programming skills uh, in uh, MATLAB, uh, we have uh, six plus minus uh, uh, two, let's say. So it is, ever, it is approximately good. And uh, sub 2000 actually, yeah, there, are, uh, there is a very good knowledge uh, averagely. Uh, let's say of uh, sub 2000, but there, there is no problem if uh, there is uh, some one of you uh, who doesn't know actually how to model in a sub 2000 rather than uh, doesn't have uh, um, pretty much um, advanced uh, programming skills because we will use a very basic uh, pro um, 
let's say instructions and so uh, and programming skills and uh, we will uh, see from the beginning to the end uh, how to model uh, uh, in sub 2000 uh, all the finite element elements and also uh, the nonlinear links uh, for the uh, isolation devices. So let's start by seeing uh, some uh, examples of the very first uh, uh, seismic isolation layers uh, that have been designed uh, in the past. So you see that this, is, this was a patent in the 1870s and the building is just isolated through uh, a rolling uh, bearing, uh, a, a set of rolling bearings. Uh, these actually are also investigated nowadays. So the, the, uh, there are a number of uh, research institutes uh, which are actually uh, studying uh, uh, rolling uh, rolling bearings in order to decouple actually the uh, behavior of the building with respect to the motion of the ground because this is uh, the actual uh, goal uh, the final goal of seismic isolation uh, in order to uh, lower to decrease uh, the seismic vulnerability of uh, uh, for for instance a building I, we are seeing in this uh, in this slide. Um, actually, we want to decouple uh, to um, the, uh, the response of the building with respect to the motion of the ground, so that uh, the uh, lower, uh, a lower, lower acceleration is transferred to the uh, superstructure, and so automatically internal forces and damage uh, are uh, consequently uh, reduced. But there are also other uh, applications, uh, but with no practical uh, realizations, uh, uh, something like the building laid on uh, a number of uh, sp steel spherical elements. Uh, and uh, you can imagine that uh, it is something like the previous one. So something rolling, but uh, since uh, here the uh, spherical elements uh, are very small, uh, so this means that uh, there, are, there is no rolling uh, uh, behavior, there no rolling motion, but uh, we have something like, uh, something like a sliding behavior. Okay, so the, the building slides uh, on the, um, this, uh, um, uh, this layer of uh, steel spherical elements. And there were also other studies uh, in 1907, uh, for instance, uh, and now we are getting close uh, to uh, what we uh, assume for seismic isolation nowadays. Uh, in this application, which has no uh, practical uh, applications, actually, this is a patent. And uh, we see that there is uh, the building, which is laid on uh, a layer or and many layers of fine grain sand with a dock connection for pipes and plants. So this is the first, the very first case, uh, um, actually it is a patent, but uh, there is no uh, uh, practical and real application, but uh, it is the first study where uh, there is also the attention not only to the uh, layer, which tries to decouple uh, the building with respect to the ground, but also with respect to plants uh, and pipes, because uh, we will see uh, later in the slides, uh, we try to decouple the building uh, with respect to the ground, but uh, this movement uh, generally has uh, is also subjected to the uh, pipes and plants. Uh, so uh, we have to study something uh, about uh, uh, about the plants, uh, and maybe uh, the, the, in this uh, in this patent something was uh, was discussed actually, and uh, there was uh, there was. Um, a particular connection, uh, which was actually a flexible connection, uh, which allows displacements uh, to occur. And then the, this is actually uh, a very, uh, a very far in past uh, uh, application. Uh, you see, there is uh, an example of a soft story design uh, of base isolation. And actually, we know uh, soft story as uh, something that uh, we have to be aware of. Uh, so uh, we have to uh, not to have soft story actually behavior in order to have a safe, uh, a safe structural system. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, uh, the soft story was studied in order to uh, reduce the vulnerability of the building. 
So the, uh, you can imagine that in this uh, particular application, uh, uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, attention to be paid uh, on the detailing, uh, for instance, uh, for both con in connections uh, for steel structures, uh, but also in detailing uh, for uh, reinforcements uh, in reinforced concrete. Because uh, if we assume that uh, there is a soft story, uh, we have to guarantee that uh, all the elements uh, can provide actually the um, um, the actual behavior that we assume in design for uh, the uh, plastic hinges at the uh, at the edges of the elements, and what actually uh, uh, has happened in the past uh, is uh, the following. Uh, this is uh, this was actually. Um, one example of uh, the soft story uh, application for seismic isolation uh, at uh, the hospital in Los Angeles. And uh, actually after this application, there was uh, an earthquake, a very famous earthquake uh, in 1971, the San Fernando uh, earthquake, uh, which caused uh, several damage to the overall building uh, and also uh, for casualties. So these uh, uh, two, um, in evidence uh, that this particular um, technology and strategy for seismic isolation doesn't work uh, uh, so well. And uh, other, these are uh, other obvious uh, consequences uh, of uh, soft stories. Uh, uh, we can see the uh, general collapse uh, configuration of the soft story uh, in, the, in the left bottom corner. Uh, where there, we have uh, all the stories which falls uh, one up to uh, the other, uh, because uh, actually there is the failure and the um, and the mechanism, uh, the horizontal mecha uh, mechanism, uh, uh, which uh, originates uh, where we have the weakest elements, uh, and uh, this is also another uh, common uh, damage uh, uh, configuration that we have with the soft story. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is actually what happens for an application studied in 1930. But uh, uh, I can ensure that uh, there is uh, uh, much research uh, which is carried out uh, also nowadays on this particular, um, I mean, uh, on this particular strategy. Uh, I'm not familiar with that, uh, and uh, actually I don't want to, uh, but uh, because I think that it is pretty dangerous uh, because uh, you see, uh, Generally, there are also many, um, uh, I mean, uh, many research articles uh, which provide evidence uh, we, uh, that uh, in uh, many cases, uh, the design uh, seismic action uh, that we consider in design uh, is actually lower with respect to the one uh, which actually occurs when a real earthquake uh, happens. This is uh, something which has to worry us uh, uh, because of the um, correctness and uh, generally, uh, uh, of the uh, of the seismic action that we consider in the standard codes, but uh, also uh, he has to it has to remind us that uh, a soft story is something to uh, is something very dangerous. So let's consider now the main goals uh, for seismic isolation. Uh, so generally, we know that uh, according to the limit states design procedure, uh, we consider in any case uh, capacity higher than the demand. The demand is caused by the uh, seismic action, uh, which is actually uh, provided by the standard code. And the capacity is uh, something that we compute according to um, generally, for instance, uh, for, uh, for steel elements, uh, we have uh, also um, standard codes for them. Also for reinforced concrete, uh, if you consider the European ones, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the EC2, Eurocode 2 for uh, reinforced concrete, uh, Eurocode 3 for uh, steel structures. There will be also the uh, uh, combined structures uh, for, uh, with both uh, steel and, and uh, uh, reinforced concrete uh, and, and so on, uh, wood, uh, wood structure and so on. So generally we uh, deal with the capacity higher than the demand. So uh, we uh, generally um, deal with ordinary design strategies. Uh, so they are also uh, force-based uh, design strategies. Uh, and generally, uh, they are focused on the increasing uh, of the capacity of the structural system uh, with respect to a given uh, seismic demand. Uh, seismic isolation uh, it is the, actually the other way around uh, because uh, the seismic isolation uh, tries to uh, lower, to decrease uh, the seismic demand uh, uh, by a given capacity. Okay, so the, the 
uh, and uh, this uh, uh, demand, the seismic demand, uh, is uh, decreased, has to be decreased, uh, actually, from both the displacement and the force tense points. Okay, so we, we will try with base isolation uh, to decrease uh, the force transfer to the superstructure, and also we will try to limit uh, the displacements. Uh, I've said limit and not decrease because one of the consequences of base isolation of seismic isolation is the increasing value of displacements. But actually, the final point is one of the uh, the most important uh, points of generally uh, pros of uh, seismic isolation. The seismic demand is approximately lumped and referred to isolation devices, uh, uh, which represent the structural elements so we can be easily substituted. So this means that the isolation are subjected to the, the maximum amount of uh, the seismic demand with a very small part, if, uh, if uh, well designed actually, uh, a small portion of the global demand which goes into, uh, into the superstructure. So let's consider the uh, uh, one by one all the main goals of seismic isolation. Uh, the first one is the period shift and the second one is energy dissipation. So why we have to consider a period shift? So why? Why do we have to increase the uh, period of the structural system? So generally, because uh, if we look at the, the uh, continuous uh, uh, lines, uh, which are referred to the uh, acceleration spectra, response spectra, we notice that uh, if we increase the period of the structure, uh, we get to uh, uh, we get toward uh, values, uh, lower values of uh, spectral coordinates. So this means that uh, the spectral acceleration is generally related to the base shear of the structure and the base shear is related to the internal forces and deformations. So this means that uh, if we increase uh, the period of the structural system, automatically we are uh, reducing uh, the spectral coordinate uh, and automatically we are re reducing also internal forces. But we know that uh, if uh, the, spectra, the acceleration spectra uh, decreases, uh, uh, if uh, the period increases, uh, the displacement spectra uh, are ac uh, actually uh, the opposite uh, behavior. Uh, so uh, as we increase uh, the uh, vibration period, uh, we have increasing values uh, of uh, uh, displacements. So this was the reason why uh, before I mentioned uh, the limitation of displacement and not the decreasing of displacement because uh, uh, we will obviously have the increasing of displacement because we have uh, we are providing period shift so we are enlarging uh, um, the um, uh, the period the self period of the building so this means that uh, we have to try to limit uh, the displacement, the displacement demand uh, through energy dissipation. And the energy dissipation is uh, directly related to uh, the equivalent viscous damping. We will see how to compute uh, this, uh, uh, this analogy. So this is another way to consider period shift and, and uh, energy dissipation. Uh, I just go back to the previous slide just to show how to compute the uh, the plots uh, in the in the next one. So in this plot, we consider both the um, uh, response spectra from the, from both the acceleration and the displacement point of view, uh, and they, both of these uh, graphs uh, are uh, functions of the uh, self period. Okay, uh, so uh, we can imagine that if we plot actually the spectral acceleration, not with respect to the period, but with respect to the displacement associated to the same value of period, we can have actually this figure, which is actually uh, the ADRS uh, spectrum, which, which means acceleration displacement response spectrum, okay? So the, this, is, uh, uh, this is actually a spectrum which provides the, uh, acceleration, the spectral acceleration uh, uh, along the vertical axis, whereas we have uh, the um, uh, spectral displacement uh, along the horizontal axis. And this is actually the shape. Uh, the, um, one of the main characteristics uh, of this plot is that uh, all the uh, lines, uh, which starts from the origin of the reference system, uh, 
uh, have uh, actually are uh, is just uh, is uh, actually related to a given value of period. Okay, so um, um, in the previous uh, representation of spectra, in this uh, uh, in this example, for instance, uh, we have the information of period uh, directly on the horizontal axis. In the ADRS uh, spectra, we have. Uh, uh, actually, the information of period uh, for all the lines uh, which are actually which passes through uh, the origin of the reference system, uh, just because uh, we know that this uh, line uh, as an equation, which is uh, actually uh, y uh, equal to um, alpha, which is just a constant value times uh, the uh, the horizontal uh, the horizontal coordinate. So I can just try to uh, to write it. So if we consider this line, this line can be considered as uh, S A equal to just a, a coefficient times uh, S D, which is the horizontal, uh, the horizontal coordinate. So we can consider this, uh, uh, this coefficient as uh, the ratio between the spectral acceleration and the spectral displacement. Okay. But we know that the relation because uh, between the uh, spectral acceleration, let's say the pseudo uh, spectral acceleration and the spectral displacement, this is uh, omega squared. And omega squared is uh, 2 pi over t, which, which t is uh, the period squared. OK, so this means that the. Uh, uh, actually, the slope uh, of all these lines uh, are directly functions uh, of uh, the period. Okay, uh, there is uh, there are actually uh, functions on of uh, one over t squared. So this means that uh, you see there is no regular uh, slope changing uh, uh, among all the uh, all the periods uh, or this period which switch from one. To the, the, uh, to the next one uh, of uh, 1 uh, 0.5 uh, uh, of a variation uh, from a 1.5 to 2, 2.5 and 3. But uh, as we enlarge the period value, we uh, obtain lines uh, which get closer and closer and closer. This is just mainly because uh, we have uh, the proportionality with respect to 1 over t squared, and it is not 1 over t. But this is a very, uh, a very important uh, tool, the ADRS uh, spectrum, because uh, in this plot, we can also consider capacity curves for buildings. Uh, because uh, if we consider that the, um, the, vertical, uh, the vertical coordinate is uh, the spectral coordinate, uh, the spectral coordinate can be seen as the, the base shear of a building divided by the total mass of the building itself. But uh, again, uh, the total mass uh, rather than uh, the uh, participating mass uh, for the first mode, uh, if uh, we have uh, the first mode, which is uh, the one actually rolling uh, the overall response, uh, which is actually what happens uh, for the, the largest part of buildings. And uh, uh, so we, we can also consider that uh, within uh, these, uh, uh, this graph, uh, we can also plot uh, maybe the capacity curve uh, of a building. Uh, and this is what we can do also for base isolation uh, and see what is the performance point uh, if it is met for a given value of, uh, of damping, uh, maybe, which is uh, related to the, to the black line uh, and so on. So, but we will see uh, all these applications uh, uh, for later on uh, uh, also in numerical simulations. So in this particular plot, so in the ADRS spectrum, we see the period shift in this way. So looking at points towards the right part of the of the graph, and then we see energy dissipation along all the lines referred to a given value of a set period. So this is the um, one of the um, main tool that we will use. Generally, uh, we will use uh, uh, spectra. Uh, so we will, uh, we will have to uh, remind uh, also the relation, this relation, uh, so the relation between uh, 
the um, pseudo acceleration and the spectral displacement. We will use it later, uh, later on in our simulations. And uh, we will have also to consider the uh, main uh, goals of seismic isolation as a period shift and energy dissipations, but they are not the only ones. So these are the main characteristics uh, for seismic isolation. Uh, isolation devices must provide the reactions against vertical loads. Uh, this means that, uh, first of all, isolation devices are structural bearings. And as structural bearings, they have to carry out vertical loads which are coming from the superstructure just due to the um, gravity loads applied. And this is very important because uh, we don't have to consider just the horizontal characteristics because we need uh, a certain amount of uh, uh, stiffness, uh, horizontal stiffness in order to have period shift. But we will have also to remind that first of all, they are bearings, they are just structural bearings. They have to be subjected to gravity loads. So they have to provide very high stiffness with respect to the vertical direction. Then the second and the third, uh, we have already discussed them, uh, but we will see uh, how to uh, consider them in the uh, computations, uh, provide the proper period shift in order to get uh, lower uh, spectral coordinates, uh, and then to provide energy dissipation uh, in order to limit uh, the horizontal displacements. We know that the overall uh, demand will be lumped at the isolation devices, but this means that they will be subjected to very large uh, displacements and they have actually to be, uh, to be designed um, to accommodate uh, actually uh, those large displacements, which is actually the fourth goal, uh, accommodate large displacement demands. And finally, the fifth is uh, uh, have a recentering behavior. And uh, we are going to discuss one, uh, one by one uh, these, uh, uh, these goals. So first of all, uh, they have to be structural bearings. Uh, this is, these are just examples. Uh, these, uh, uh, this is, uh, these are bearings uh, for a very large plant. And uh, these are bearings uh, for one of the most famous uh, applications uh, of uh, seismic isolation in Italy, which is uh, Progetto Case at L'Aquila after the uh, strong earthquake uh, uh, which occurred in uh, 2009. And uh, actually, they are isolators, but they are also bearings. So here, there are vertical loads which are applied to all the devices and that they have actually to withstand to uh, gravity loads uh, and also not only gravity loads actually, because uh, we know that uh, during uh, the seismic motion, uh, we have the variation of the axial load in the columns uh, due to the overturning effect, uh, because we have uh, the um, actually uh, all the forces lumped, uh, horizontal forces lumped uh, at all the story levels. Uh, so we, uh, the inertia forces, uh, which leads to an overturning effect uh, uh, for the whole building. And this overturning moment uh, is uh, then smeared uh, among all the, all the columns uh, in terms of uh, axial load variations. Uh, so we will have also not only gravity loads, but also uh, the variation uh, due to the um, actually horizontal um, seismic motion. Then we can also consider that uh, generally uh, the seismic motion uh, is not only horizontal, but uh, there is also the vertical component. And the vertical component in many regions uh, can, uh, not, not in Italy maybe, but uh, worldwide, it can reach uh, very, high, uh, very high values. So uh, we have to remember that they, will, they have to be uh, structural bearings. So there are a, a number of verifications that we have to consider in order to provide the effective uh, stiffness for vertical loads. So uh, we have to provide the proper period shift. Uh, so in order to understand this, uh, I just want you to consider a very simplified uh, system for a base isolation building, uh, for a base isolated building. So let's consider a building which is base isolated. So something like we have the ground, we have isolators, very simple. And then we have maybe a plate. And then we will have our building. 
Okay. Um, generally, a building uh, can be uh, considered as a, a single degree of freedom if we consider just as a different mode of, of vibration. It is a very, very simple uh, modeling assumption because uh, we, we forget everything about the building, uh, all the the sizes, uh, the elements, the material, but uh, we just consider a self period, uh, the mass, uh, the total mass uh, or the uh, participating mass uh, for the first mode. So the, generally, uh, this is a very simplifi um, a simplification assumption, uh, but we can do that just to understand the behavior of seismic isolation. And uh, let's consider also the, uh, the layer, uh, the isolation layer also as a spring. So we what we, want to consider is uh, just something like that. We have uh, an initial spring, uh, which is uh, related to isolators. This is, uh, let's call it uh, uh, the mass of the plate. And this is the uh, mass of the building. Then we have uh, the stiffness. Uh, the stiffness of the isolation system. Again, the mass of the plate. And then we have a linear spring related to the building, so KB. And then let's call it the mass of the building, which could be generally rather than the mass, the total mass of the building, rather than the participating mass of of actually the, um, the first mode. Okay, so if we neglect uh, actually the uh, effect of this mass, the, uh, the mass of the plate, what we obtain is just a series of two springs. Okay, so let's consider MB much greater than MP. Okay, so what we get is something like that. The first spring K isolation. Then we just consider the connection point between the two springs and then the other spring, which is related to the building, and then the mass of the building. Okay. If we have two springs which are in series, we can compute an equivalent. An equivalent spring which has this stiffness. The equivalent stiffness of this series is actually the product between the two divided by the summation. So this means that we have K building times K isolation divided by the summation. So divided by K building plus K isolation. Okay, so what happens is that generally the building has a much higher stiffness related to the first mode with respect to the stiffness that we want to consider for the, the isolation devices. Uh, we want the period shift, so we want to enlarge actually the, uh, the overall behavior of the, um, uh, of the vibration period of the building. So this means that we can ensure that K building is much higher than K isolation. If this is true, we can consider from the mathematical point of view, something like that, the limit of KB, which tends to infinite of K equivalent. And for this rational function, uh, the uh, limit for KB, which tends to infinite uh, of uh, uh, this rational function is uh, directly equal to the ratio of the coefficient of KB. So this means that this is the ratio of K isolation divided by one, because here we have one times KB, okay? So this limit, limit is actually K isolation. Okay, and what happens is that the equivalent stiffness of the of these uh, 
uh, scheme, which is very simplified, but actually allows us to understand the effect of base isolation, can be assumed equal to K isolation. Okay. So regardless of the building, we can consider that the overall behavior, which is this two degree of freedom system, can be considered as just a single degree of freedom system, where we consider just K isolation and then just a single mass as M taught, which is actually M building plus M plate. Okay, this is a this allows us to understand the effect of uh, the period shift, but also allows us to consider one of the most important simplification that we will use uh, in design, which is actually to consider uh, a, seismic isolated, a seismically isolated system as uh, a one degree of freedom. And the, uh, for uh, given a, a single degree of freedom system, uh, we have just to define a stiffness, a stiffness coefficient and just a mass. The uh, stiffness coefficient is directly the stiffness of the isolation layer. And the mass is the uh, total mass, uh, which is uh, above the isolation layer. Okay, so this, uh, this will be very important uh, for us to design uh, actually with the simplified rules, uh, uh, all the um, main typologies uh, of uh, uh, isolation systems uh, that we, uh, we know nowadays, uh, generally we will see, uh, we will discuss them uh, later on. Um, now let's discuss about the- Sorry. Uh, yes, there is a question. Sorry. Yes. yes. Can you please just repeat how you derived K equivalent equal to K isolator? Yeah. Just okay. the final part of this infinity. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, we consider the true degree of freedom system as uh, just uh, uh, a series of two springs. So this means that we have uh, no mass here, or maybe we have uh, the mass of the building, which is much higher than the mass of the plate. So if we have uh, two springs, uh, which are in series, the equivalent stiffness coefficient, uh, which is just how to, to switch from these two springs to just one spring, K equivalent, and here MB. K equivalent uh, is uh, equal to this expression. So the multiplication of the stiffness coefficients of the springs uh, divided by the summation of the stiffness coefficients. So generally, uh, we have to consider the stiffness, uh, the, the stiffness of the seismic isolation uh, much lower than the stiffness of the building. Uh, we want to enlarge the period. Uh, so given the expression of the period, uh, which is actually uh, this one, we remember T is equal to two pi's divided by M over K. This, the stiffness uh, is uh, at the denominator of that expression. So this means that uh, if we increase uh, the stiffness, uh, we uh, reduce uh, the period uh, and vice versa, obviously. So this means that uh, if we want to get a higher value of period, uh, we have actually to reduce uh, um, uh, to reduce the stiffness. Uh, so we need uh, the isolation layer to have uh, a very low value of stiffness. And so we can uh, assume that uh, the stiffness of the building uh, is uh, much higher than the stiffness uh, of the isolation system. So according to this, uh, if we want to translate this uh, assumption uh, into the mathematics, uh, we can consider the limit uh, of uh, the stiffness of the building, which tends to infinite, uh, because uh, uh, we can consider the K of the building uh, very high, so infinite, uh, approximately infinite with respect to the K isolation of the expression of the K equivalent, which is this one, which is a rational function. And this limit uh, leads to the ratio of the coefficients of KB. So this is K isolation divided by one. So K isolation. So this means that uh, if we consider, but the, just if we consider KB much higher than K isolation, the equivalent stiffness uh, is, uh, can be actually approximated to uh, K isolation. 
So this means that by looking at the two degree of freedom, the KI isolation is the, the one which rules the overall behavior. So whatever is above uh, that spring uh, can be considered as just a single lamped mass, okay? So this means that we have uh, the overall behavior, which, is, which can be represented by a single degree of freedom oscillator with uh, the stiffness uh, directly equal to K isolation and the mass equal to the total mass of the structural system, which is uh, the summation of the mass of the building and mass of the plate. Is that clear or? Yes, it is now. Thank you. Okay, perfect. You're welcome. Okay, if there is no other questions, okay, we can move on to the third goal, which is uh, the energy dissipation. Okay, generally, energy dissipation is uh, directly related to the uh, equivalent viscous damping. Okay, we know damping from the uh, expression and from the theory of the single degree of freedom oscillator. So we, we know, for instance, if we consider something like this, we have K and we have uh, uh, M, but we have also C because we consider just a, a dash pot uh, as, uh, uh, as the effects of damping. But we can also notice that this uh, uh, overall system can be considered as uh, the normalized one, which is actually the following. Uh, the second derivative uh, of, the display, of the relative displacement, which is actually the relative uh, uh, acceleration plus two omega C, um, the relative velocity plus omega squared relative displacements equal to the ground motions in terms of acceleration, ground acceleration time series. Okay, so generally we consider damping as the uh, damping ratio C. And we know that, for instance, uh, with the uh, C value, the damping for um, reinforced concrete is something like 5%. Uh, we consider 2% for steel structures. Uh, and then in this short course, uh, we will learn uh, uh, which, which are the ranges uh, of equivalent viscous damping for all the technologies that we will consider. And uh, why, actually, this behavior is directly associated to uh, damping uh, so, uh, so to uh, energy dissipation. So this is just uh, according to the formulation of the dashboard uh, that for, the, for a linear dashboard. We have that the, let's call it uh, FC, the, the force response of a linear dashboard is uh, a constant C times uh, the velocity, okay? So let us consider an harmonic motion. So this means uh, something like uh, the displacement time series, which is uh, equal to a maximum displacement times uh, the sinus of uh, two pi frequency time, okay? So the, uh, if this is the time series, uh, if we want to compute the first derivative, which is actually the velocity, the velocity as a function of time, this is equal to the first derivative of this, which is the two pi frequency V max. And this is actually V max times cosine of two pi frequency time. Okay, so if we compute the force displacement plot of this force, so we want to consider the graphical representation of the force displacement for FC with respect to, let's consider D. Okay, the graphical representation of this force is uh, something related to this expression and this expression because the force is uh, C, which is just a constant, uh, times uh, uh, U point, which is actually the first derivative of displacement. Uh, we can write it uh, C times V of T. Okay. 
So if we want to uh, provide the graphical results for FC with respect to D, we have something like cosinus with respect to sinus uh, with the different coefficients. So this is something like ellipsoidal. Okay, so we have something like this. Let us assume that this is the shape. Okay, so the maximum force is directly related to the maximum velocity. So this is actually B max times C. And obviously here we have the maximum displacement and zero force. We have zero force because according to the harmonic uh, motion, we have the maximum displacement when the velocity is zero. Whenever we reach the maximum displacement, we have a, a tangent, uh, an horizontal tangent line uh, in the time series of displacement. So we have uh, automatically uh, zero velocity. So we see that the uh, linear dashboard provides this force displacement relation. And this means that the force displacement has hysteresis. There is uh, this area of hysteresis. And uh, generally, the area provided by a force displacement um, a behavior can be directly associated to energy dissipated. Okay, because the, just the, it is the integral of the force with respect to the displacement. And this is actually the, the definition of work and energy. So this means that the integral of uh, this uh, uh, graphical representation is the energy. We can call it uh, EDC. And then uh, in the next lecture, so you will notice that this parameter can be very useful also from the, uh, actually tomorrow, uh, uh, also from the experimental point of view. EDC stands for energy dissipated per cycle. And uh, this is just because we have considered a fully, um, fully reverse cycle because we want we uh, we go from zero to the maximum displacement, then to the minimum, and then back to zero. So this is uh, the total energy dissipated per cycle is the area of this ellipsoidal shape, and the area is actually pi times the first radius which is d max times the vertical dimension which is c times d max okay so the, there is this relation between the hysteresis area of the force displacement loop for the linear dashboard and the uh, maximum displacement and the maximum uh, the maximum velocity. Now, instead of C, we want to consider the express the normalized expression of C, which is actually uh, I rewrite EDC equal to pi d max. Instead of C, we consider two C omega, and then we have to multiply by m the mass, which is missing here, but just because this is uh, this equation is uh, uh, mass normalized. Okay. Times again, B max. Okay. So it is a bit mess, but uh, now we are going to uh, simplify that expression because uh, what we can consider here, okay, EDC uh, is uh, the area, the hysteresis area of the force displacement loop. Then we have pi, which is just a number. D max is the maximum displacement. Uh, C is uh, the uh, normalized, uh, the damping ratio, let's say. Uh, omega M B max, uh, we have somehow to change uh, these uh, uh, contributions uh, into another parameter. Okay, but we can see that omega v max can be considered as the maximum acceleration. Okay, if we have uh, harmonic motion 
you see that Vmax is just 2 pi f, which is omega, actually, times d max. And the same if we if we compute the first derivative of the v over t, we compute that the maximum amplitude of acceleration, which is actually the first derivative of velocity, is omega times v max. So omega times v max, which is these, which are uh, these two parameters, is equal to the maximum acceleration. And the maximum acceleration times the mass is actually the maximum force. Okay. So what we can compute is EDC is equal to 2 pi C D max F max. Okay. And this is actually what we use for the computation of the equivalent viscous damping for a given uh, technology of seismic isolation, because uh, then we can collect actually C in order to compute the following. I just erase because I have to, I don't have too much space. So the final expression that we will use is C equal to the ratio between the energy dissipated per cycle and two pi maximum displacement and maximum force. This is the expression of the equivalent viscous damping according to the Jacobsen expression, the Jacobsen, the Jacobsen formulation, which relates actually the uh, hysteresis area of the first uh, of the force displacement loop for a given element with respect to the uh, maximum displacement and the maximum force. And this means that uh, we can use actually this expression for any kind of, uh, um, let's say, nonlinear hysteretic uh, uh, behavior in order to compute a numerical value of uh, uh, damping ratio. So um, you have can I ask something, please? Yes. Um, so if you, if you want to install some uh, isolation devices, uh, the manufacturer will give you the uh, equivalent damping per cycle. And from that, you can calculate the, uh, the damping ratio. Is this yeah, how it um, works? It is not generally like that because uh, generally um, damping ratio may vary uh, because uh, because of the nonlinearity of the system. Um, I mean that's uh, I mean uh, in the um, practical applications uh, there are several typologies of uh, uh, of devices. There are some of them, and we are going to see some characteristics of them. Uh, for instance, rubber bearings, uh, we, which have. Uh, approximately constant uh, damping ratio. So this is actually what uh, we were mentioning. Uh, the producer of the, those devices uh, provides the numerical value of damping ratio. But there are other uh, typologies uh, which are highly nonlinear. For instance, the lead rubber bearings, uh, rather than the sliding devices, for instance, the friction pendulum bearings, uh, which actually are highly nonlinear. They produce uh, um, much higher uh, hysteresis. So this means that maybe uh, the, equi the equivalent viscous damping may vary. Um, and so uh, an iterative procedure is needed. But um, what is uh, approximately what, we, uh, what we, you were mentioning is that uh, for sure for design, and uh, I, will, uh, I will show you how to do that, uh, we have to start from uh, uh, some initial design assumptions. Uh, and uh, in these uh, assumptions, uh, there is uh, an, a numerical assumption of uh, the uh, damping value. So we will assume a damping value. And then according to this uh, and also other parameters, uh, we will obtain the characteristics uh, of uh, the uh, devices. And then we have to go to the uh, producers uh, and then to choose uh, the, the, best, uh, the best device which fits uh, our uh, our uh, computations in design. So generally, yes, uh, it, it could be a constant parameter for some uh, typologies, but it could vary uh, if uh, the behavior of the device is uh, highly nonlinear. Yeah, I see. Thank you very much. You're welcome. 
And actually, this is uh, the opposite because uh, uh, of the linear dashboard, because uh, you have seen that uh, how our reasoning uh, has led us to the definition of the energy dissipated per cycle uh, as a function of the uh, damping ratio. For uh, seismic isolation devices, uh, we do the opposite. Uh, with, uh, generally, we have, uh, because we can, uh, we can uh, perform tests, uh, experimental tests, uh, we have the force speed displacement uh, loops. So according to the, um, actually, generally, we have uh, the time series of displacement and the time series of force. So we can provide also the uh, graphical result of the force displacement loops. Uh, according to those results, uh, we can compute actually the energy dissipated per cycle. And according to that value, we can compute an equivalent uh, viscous damping, uh, an equivalent damping ratio. And uh, I keep mentioning the equivalent damping ratio. Why? Uh, well, just because uh, the damping ratio is uh, directly related to a linear dashboard. Okay. So we can define the, the, um, the C parameter just whenever we, uh, act, uh, we deal with a linear dashboard. So this means uh, the force times, uh, uh, sorry, the force is equal to a constant times uh, the velocity. But generally what we will deal, uh, we will deal with uh, is uh, um, generally uh, seismic isolator. And uh, those isolators uh, can have, uh, can experience a uh, much nonlinear behavior. So, so we can, uh, we can actually switch from the nonlinear behavior to an equivalent linear behavior. And the equivalent linear behavior will, will be represented by an equivalent viscous damping and also an equivalent stiffness, uh, let's say equivalent period uh, or effective period, which will be actually uh, the uh, second period at maximum displacement, but we will discuss it uh, later on in the slides. So uh, we have seen in this slide that uh, hysteresis area leads to energy dissipation and energy dissipation, uh, even for non-linear behaviors uh, can be expressed uh, as uh, a damping ratio. And the damping ratio actually will be a key parameter for us uh, to define uh, the um, energy, um, uh, energy dissipation capacity for a given uh, technology of seismic isolation. The fourth point was to accommodate large displacement demands. Uh, uh, and these are actually uh, figures uh, uh, taken from the uh, presentation of uh, Professor Michael Costantino uh, delivered within the webinar I was mentioning before. And uh, you can find uh, both the um, Actually, uh, you can find the video in my YouTube channel, but uh, I also I will also provide the slides uh, as a PDF file uh, within uh, our uh, shared folder in the Google Drive. I will share it uh, later after the uh, after the lecture, and uh, I just want you to see these two examples, uh, which are actually real uh, applications. And uh, for instance, okay, they are particular typologies of uh, devices. They are sliding devices, uh, also with multiple uh, sliding surfaces. But I just want you to uh, pay attention on the maximum amplitude of displacement, which is one meter. One meter displace horizontal displacement. So this means that uh, the, it is a huge device. Uh, yes. Uh, this is a, a, a triple uh, friction pendulum, a triple friction pendulum isolator. So this means that uh, um, thanks to the uh, to all the um, sliding surfaces which are implemented within the within the device, uh, we can accommodate large displacements with just with the smaller uh, lens sizes so with respect just to a single uh, pendulum system. But at least the one meter of displacement is uh, is very high value. And uh, actually, this was, uh, I think, uh, for, uh, and also the other one, the other one, okay, it is not one meter, it is uh, 70 centimeters, uh, but uh, the other one, the second one, uh, has a huge maximum vertical load, uh, 130 meganewtons, uh, which means uh, 130,000 kilonewtons, uh, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, huge, uh, which is 1 million tons, uh, something like that. And uh, uh, you have uh, these very large uh, applications uh, for offshore 
structures uh, and maybe also for uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, Professor Costantino, I had the occasion to uh, discuss with him uh, about these, uh, these applications. Uh, he told me that um, generally you have also, uh, you can imagine that uh, in, all, uh, in the overall design procedures, we have uh, actually uncertainties uh, which has to be carried out uh, during our uh, and accounted for during our computations in design. Uh, we have to consider that, that there are uncertainties in the property of the devices, uh, the uncertainty in the behavior of the structure, the uncertainty coming from the uh, actually the seismic action. Uh, we, we are not ensured that the earthquake will be lower than the assumed target spectrum uh, and so on. And generally, uh, you can imagine how, uh, how much this uncertainty can be dangerous uh, when uh, you are designing the isolation system for a nuclear power plant. And uh, this is the reason why he told me that uh, generally, um, according to, he, he carries out uh, uh, computations uh, for the definition of the maximum displacement demand. And then that number is multiplied by three. So 300% of the numerical value returned by computations uh, will be the final maximum allowance of displacement uh, for nuclear power plants. Uh, and uh, this is actually reasonable. Uh, it, it could not be reasonable for ordinary applications uh, for buildings, for instance, because otherwise uh, the, uh, from the economic point of view, it would, be not, it, it would not be uh, sustainable. But actually for nuclear power plants, uh, it, it is, much worse uh, to, to get failure of devices uh, rather than to install very large devices which can accommodate very large displacements. This, is, this was actually one, uh, one example you have uh, up to one meter, but uh, he told me that the, he designed also some, de uh, some devices uh, which can uh, reach uh, up to uh, 1.5 meters uh, of lateral displacement. And obviously, whenever, um, uh, uh, whenever you have a very large uh, displacement capacity, you have also um, you have also a large uh, uh, velocity demand. Uh, uh, actually, now I, it was just to better highlight the one meter. I can do that uh, in an easy way. Uh, the peak velocity is uh, again one meter per second, which is a huge velocity. And uh, maybe with uh, these velocities, uh, you can uh, have uh, some. Uh, problems uh, in the uh, realistic and practical uh, response force response of the of devices uh, because of the uh, of the eating uh, of uh, all the internal portions uh, of the device itself and so finally the resenting behavior this is the first time we mentioned uh, we mentioned that behavior and this uh, this is actually uh, related to uh, residual deformations uh, uh, we know residual deformation as a cumulative damage uh, uh, for buildings, uh, for instance, for reinforced concrete, uh, whenever we have reinforced concrete or also the plastic behavior of steel structures, uh, uh, since there is plasticity, we, we can have uh, uh, residual deformations, uh, but also for nonlinear behaviors of seismic devices, we can have uh, residual displacements, just because residual displacements can occur whenever we have something nonlinear. Uh, and uh, uh, they can be easily um, represented by the displacements value that we have uh, when the force gets back to zero here, but also here, obviously. And this is the uh, residual displacements. Uh, uh, this is the residual displacement just from the theory, uh, from the theoretical point of view. But uh, generally, uh, that, uh, those displacements, the residual displacements at the end of, the, of a seismic event uh, can be uh, lower uh, in uh, uh, in your real applications, uh, because they are actually functions of the superstructure response. Uh, um, if we think about, again, uh, the building uh, and uh, the isolation systems, here there is the plate uh, and then the building. Because of the elastic behavior of the building, uh, the elastic behavior works uh, exactly has a recentering behavior. So the, the elastic motion of the building tries to actually to recenter the, um, the overall uh, building in the uh, undeformed shape, actually. So this means that the recentering behavior for a given, uh, for a given device 
is, uh, um, is fairly designed uh, if uh, at the end of a seismic event, uh, the building goes back to approximately zero configuration, displaced configuration. Uh, but we know that uh, in the real, uh, in realistic seismic events, uh, actually also the um, elastic contribution of the superstructure actually helps to go back to zero, so to, so to recenter the overall, uh, the overall system. So this uh, uh, slide, with this slide, uh, we start accounting for the main characteristics uh, of, the, uh, of the isolation devices. Uh, so generally, when, when we have to face uh, to some design problems about base isolation, about seismic isolation, we have to start with some assumptions. One of them, uh, as I mentioned before, it will be the equivalent viscous damping according to the typologies uh, uh, which are provided uh, by producers. But the other one will be surely the design period of the overall system and how to choose that value. Um, actually, there is a minimum value for uh, the design, uh, actually for the design uh, um, period of the system. How to compute them? Uh, let's consider the uh, fixed period base, uh, sorry, the fixed base period uh, of the building. So whenever we can, cons uh, we, we have, uh, we get uh, damage uh, if uh, subjected to um, actually uh, earthquake motions. And we have uh, obviously the um, behavior factor, which reduces the elastic spectrum, which is uh, this one, the elastic one, with the equivalent viscous damping 5%. Uh, this spectrum is uh, reduced by the uh, behavior factor of the fixed base configuration of the building. And then in order, uh, with the uh, self period of the building with the fixed base configuration, uh, we can compute actually the um, spectral coordinate as a function of the period. Then we can consider this value, which is S A as a function of uh, TBF and Q, which is actually a period of the fixed base configuration and the behavior factor related again to the fixed base configuration. If we consider the same spectral coordinate also for the uh, base isolated building, which is actually the green spectrum, it is something like going to the same value in the green spectrum and then to compute actually the related value of uh, isolation period. And this is actually the minimum period for the isolation system. Why? Well, because if we consider lower values of periods, the green, uh, I mean, the green spectrum provides numerical values of spectral coordinates, which, has, which are higher than this value. Whereas if we consider higher values of period, we get lower values with respect to this value. And the spectral coordinate is generally as, uh, related to the base shear, and the base shear is directly, uh, directly related to internal forces and displacements and deformations. So, so this means that if we are actually reducing the base shear and uh, automatically we are reducing also the spectral coordinate, we are reducing the overall uh, damage in the structure. So this means that that value of period is actually the lower bound for our design. But generally, this is, this is a computation to be performed at the beginning of, of the, actually uh, a design procedure. And then uh, we have to choose, uh, we will see the procedure uh, for designing all the typologies of isolation devices. Uh, actually, we have to assume an initial, val an initial value of uh, design period for our system. And generally, uh, we, we will assume periods uh, which are actually higher than 2.5 seconds. Uh, um, two seconds uh, is fair enough, but uh, it is not so common in real application. But um, I think that the, the very lower bound will be 2.5. So you may ask us, so why computing minimum isolation period if the minimum isolation period is equal to 1.5? 
well, if uh, the minimum period is uh, 1.5, okay, there is no need to compute it, but uh, because we will assume 2.5. But uh, in some applications, uh, um, I mean, in some cases, uh, you get a minimum isolation period, which is actually 2.5. So that, that is very useful because uh, instead of 2.5, you will choose three, okay? Uh, this is very important because otherwise uh, you don't get any, um, any improvement uh, of the structural response because uh, it is actually, maybe you get, in the best case, uh, you get exactly the same response of the fixed base configuration, but you can also get worse uh, and getting uh, actually more damage uh, and uh, with respect to the, uh, to the fixed base con configuration. So this is a very important parameter to, uh, to compute. Uh, I have a question, please. Yeah. Um, why don't you, for example, consider that the minimum period for the isolation is the one that uh, pushes the structure towards the elastic response spectrum, so that we ensure that uh, everything will will remain elastic? Because uh, is the green the green one is not for the elastic, right? It's not elastic. Yeah. Uh, generally, uh, the um, when you uh, design a base isolation seismic isolation, uh, the superstructure has to be um, has to remain within the elastic range. Uh, so uh, it has it has not to to yield. Uh, so that is uh, generally um, a characteristics for any kind of uh, initial period that you assume for uh, for the isolation system. Um, so given that, uh, generally you can uh, you can assume that uh, the uh, superstructure will not yield. So this means that, that uh, will uh, the response the force response will be uh, within the, the elastic range because this is actually a requirement from the standard code. And whatever the period uh, you will choose, uh, this has to be ensured. Uh, so this means that uh, according to the initial period and generally the, uh, the isolation system that, that uh, you will design, uh, then the internal forces and actually uh, the uh, detailing of all the elements, uh, detailing for uh, connections and uh, sections for steel uh, and also reinforcements for reinforced concrete, uh, must be a function of what you have designed because in any way uh, the super the superstructure will not have to uh, to yield yeah i don't know if i answered the question uh yeah yeah i understand Thank okay you. perfect perfect yeah uh, in this slide that there is the, gra uh, the graphical representation of damage for the building but this is just to remind that uh, the yellow spectrum uh, is uh, related to the fixed bay configuration but uh, we are designing the uh, the right building, uh, so the uh, actually the, the base isolated one. So this is the this is the reason why of the figure, but um, regardless the period, uh, the standard code uh, leads to uh, an elastic definition and design of the superstructure. Yeah, maybe uh, elastic means that. Uh, yeah, you can consider a little bit of yielding and plastic uh, behavior, but uh, uh, up to a behavior factor of 1.5, which is very close to one. So this means that, okay, maybe there is a little bit of yielding uh, and a little bit of plastic range, but very limited uh, up to 1.5 of uh, actually uh, of behavior factor. So let's have a look now, uh, if there is no other question, obviously. Um, we will look at the characteristics of all the typologies uh, that we will consider, which are actually the most common uh, in the common practice. And the first one is the elastomeric bearing. Um, actually, the elastomeric bearing is made up of rubber, which is uh, uh, actually a very um, flexible material, and uh, steel layers, uh, steel stiffening layers. Uh, here, there is a figure which shows uh, uh, all the internal components. We have characteristics for the rubber compound, uh, which could be soft, medium, hard. And the uh, most important parameter for the rubber compound is uh, the shear modulus, uh, which goes from uh, 0.4 megapascals uh, up to 1.4. Um, you see that it is a very low value. Uh, the most common values is, uh, uh, are related to 1 megapascals, 0.8, 1 megapascals. And, uh, Generally, the shear strain at maximum displacement is considered as 100% or even larger, but 100% is, is the very, uh, uh, the most common actually. And uh, as a shear strain, uh, I refer to this uh, displaced configuration at maximum displacement. The, uh, it, uh, 
actually deforms uh, like that. And uh, this is uh, the applied displacement, let's say d max. And uh, let's assume capital H as the total height of the um, of the isolator. So d max over h is equal to the shear strain. Okay, so this is actually this angle. Professor, so this, sorry, yeah. one question. Yes. Um, how does the d max usually find the to what hazard? Uh, excuse me, could you, could you repeat? Uh, how does the D max is defined, the maximum yeah, displacement uh, for what yeah, seismic hazard? Yeah, this is directly related to uh, the, uh, the seismic hazard, so the spectrum uh, and so on. So uh, this is the outcome actually uh, of the design procedure. We will see, uh, I think, uh, uh, Thursday or uh, no, I think uh, Friday or Friday this week, uh, how to design all the uh, all the devices. Uh, but uh, this is actually uh, a target value for for the device, which has to be defined by design. Uh, it will be a result of another procedure and we will see how to do that. So uh, was, by now it is just uh, a characteristic, a uh, global characteristic of uh, these bearings. So let us assume that the max is uh, the maximum displacement. Uh, according to this configuration, this place configuration, uh, the shear strain uh, is generally assumed as uh, 100%. Actually, we can say that um, generally the isolator height is exactly equal to the maximum displacement because 100% uh, uh, is uh, actually the same thing is of saying gamma equal to one. Okay, so this means that the, the height of the uh, of the device is exactly equal to the maximum displacement, uh, which is uh, uh, the outcome of the design uh, uh, of the design procedure. And then equivalent viscous damping, we have seen now uh, what we uh, what we consider as equivalent viscous damping. So it is the C value, which is equivalent to a linear dashpot, can be considered as uh, five to ten percent as uh, LDRB, which stands for low damping uh, rubber bearings, uh, rather than from ten to fifteen percent uh, for high damping uh, HDRB, high damping rubber bearings. Uh, so these are numerical values. Uh, um, really, um, if uh, by mentioning the the questions before, uh, they are just fixed values. Uh, these uh, particular devices uh, uh, are have actually a constant value of uh, equivalent viscous damping uh, and it is given by the producer because uh, because of the rubber compound which is used by uh, by the producer and the overall um, setup of the device so we can consider a fixed value of damping for the elastomeric purely elastomeric bearings and there are a number of modeling assumptions that we will see all of them uh, also by practicing uh, also in, uh, in some uh, computations. Uh, the bearing, uh, this is the easiest bearing that we can consider for uh, seismic isolation. The bearing can be modeled as a just as a linear spring with respect to the horizontal displacements, uh, also for the vertical one, we will see uh, how, to, how it changes. And uh, this is uh, a very famous, expression for the lateral the lateral stiffness of such bearings and the energy dissipation characteristics are directly related to the linear dashboard with a constant damping and generally this is this is true constant damping if the maximum shear strain is greater than or equal to 100 percent otherwise uh, also the, uh, also the shear modulus varies, uh, but uh, generally 100% uh, is actually a lower bound for uh, the maximum shear strain. And this is a comparison actually of realistic uh, um, experimental data uh, returned by the uh, uh, actually a, a full scale device, which is the blue line uh, and uh, the numerical value of uh, uh, a numerical simulation of the behavior. And you see that uh, actually they are ellipsoidal shapes, but they are rotated with respect to the uh, tangent, uh, sorry, the, the second stiffness. So 
this is actually something like uh, a linear spring with a linear dashboard. And this is, uh, these are the easiest bearings that we can consider because uh, the other two typologies that we are going to see later on, uh, they are actually uh, much, uh, much more nonlinear. And there are also new applications uh, uh, in research and uh, there are actually uh, recycled rubber bearings uh, because uh, uh, the, uh, the overall compound uh, is obtained by considering uh, used uh, tires, uh, which are reduced, uh, uh, reduced to uh, rubber pellets uh, uh, through crushing and micro crushing procedures. And this is actually in the left uh, um, uh, full scale bearing uh, that we have studied uh, in research. And this is just made uh, of uh, uh, made up of uh, many layers uh, of this particular material uh, with uh, obviously also uh, uh, still uh, stiffening layers uh, because we need the stiffening layers uh, because otherwise uh, also the vertical um, also the vertical stiff, uh, stiffness becomes very low but we have to remember the first uh, the, the first goal of uh, seismic isolation is that devices uh, must be uh, structural bearings so we need to provide the high stiffness with respect to the vertical forces and we need uh, to do that um, in order to do that uh, we have to install uh, also uh, steel layers uh, within the device and uh, this is uh, actually a video that i provided uh, with the uh, the uh, actually video recording of a testing uh, of a, an experimental test in the laboratory of the Center Foundation. And there is, you will see at the top part of the video, the uh, displacement time series. And uh, in the left, uh, in the right part, the force displacement loop. And you see that uh, the force displacement is actually an ellipsoidal shape uh, rotated uh, with respect to the stiffness. Uh, of the bearing and I want you to see again if I'm able to okay and uh, you will see that uh, the um, the angle of the ellipsoidal shape of these stereosis loops uh, changes uh, during cycles uh, and this is another um, characteristic that we want generally to uh, highlight during the experimental campaigns uh, so the degradation uh, of the mechanical properties of devices uh, during uh, the uh, during the cycles uh, so during multi cycle multi cycles excitations now, another uh, typology of devices, which is still a rubber bearing, but uh, there is an addition, which is a, a dissipative lead core. Uh, the rubber compound characteristics are, are exactly the same. We have soft, medium, hard compounds uh, with exactly the same uh, shear modulus values. But we have also a um, dissipative lead core, and uh, the behavior of uh, this uh, lead core is uh, just to provide uh, uh, an additional um, dissipation capacity to the overall device. Uh, and uh, we will see that uh, there is uh, still the, um, the behavior of rubber compound, which is a linear uh, behavior with a very small capacity of the uh, dissipating energy um, related to the, cost, the constant um, um, equivalent vis viscous damping ratio. And uh, according to the lead core, the lead core can be associated to a const, uh, an elastic and uh, constant uh, uh, hysteresis loop, uh, so elastoplastic behavior. So according to this behavior, we can consider a yielding shear strain, uh, which is approximately bounded between 2 and 7%. But again, uh, we, I will show that, uh, that the most frequent uh, value is 2.5%. Uh, I will give you a paper on that. Uh, I've just uh, authored uh, a paper on this uh, of, on a fast designed uh, procedure for isolation bearings uh, in which there are all these, uh, all these parameters uh, uh, detailed. Uh, uh, within uh, distributions uh, and, uh, and numerical values. And again, the maximum shear strain uh, is uh, bounded between 80% and 140, but uh, the most uh, common value is 100% exactly as a, an ordinary uh, rubber bearing. So the response of the device, as I mentioned, uh, can be considered uh, as the summation, uh, the superposition of two individual behaviors. So the force response of the lead core, which is uh, an elastoplastic hysteric, uh, hysteretic loop, 
uh, rather than the uh, rubber uh, the, the rubber um, response, which is again modeled as a linear spring. So this is the final uh, modeling assumption uh, that we can consider in uh, design and assessing uh, uh, structural systems based isolated through lead rubber bearings. So we will have the, um, the initial stiffness, which, uh, which is directly related to the lead core response. And then we have uh, the plastic, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, post yield stiffness, the plastic stiffness, uh, which is directly related to the rubber portion of the bearing. And again, uh, this is a comparison uh, between uh, the uh, experimental blue lines uh, and uh, the uh, numerical model, which can be uh, characterized uh, through uh, these uh, uh, elastoplastic uh, with hardening uh, behavior. And uh, uh, then we will see how these mechanical properties uh, are um, actually distributed uh, uh, from, the uh, from the statistical point of view. And finally, we have the curved surface slider devices. Uh, uh, we can uh, consider them also as uh, a friction pendulum, uh, which is the uh, very first name uh, uh, of the first patent, uh, which, which was actually from uh, uh, Professor Michael Costantino. And uh, they are based on uh, sliding motions, uh, on uh, uh, sliding interfaces. And generally, the interfaces are made up of uh, stainless steel, which is polished uh, up to mirror finish. And the particular innovative uh, sliding materials, which are uh, actually plastic materials, uh, they could be uh, <coughs> Teflon, uh, Teflon materials, uh, PTFE uh, materials, rather than uh, polyethylene uh, and something like that. The overall um, mechanical property for this uh, sliding interface uh, will be the friction coefficient. And uh, we can have these ranges of variation. Uh, we can have uh, from 0.5% to 4% if we have a lubricated material. And generally, the uh, surface of this material is um, actually provides actually some uh, portions and holes where the, there is a lubrication grease uh, which is uh, actually smeared uh, on the surface uh, in order to um, decrease, uh, uh, to lower and lower the, uh, the friction coefficient if you want uh, actually uh, uh, no hysteresis loops. Uh, then uh, the dry materials uh, are directly related to much higher uh, friction coefficient uh, from 4% to 15%. And then there is the equivalent radius of curvature, which is uh, uh, bounded between 1.5 meters uh, to uh, 6 meters. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that the uh, sliding surface is not a flat one, but uh, it is a spherical surface. So this means that the overall uh, building or, or bridge, I mean, uh, based isolated through this typology of devices, uh, actually provides uh, a pendulum motion, uh, which uh, uh, also combines uh, the horizontal motion induced by the seismic event to a vertical motion induced by the pendulum, um, the pendulum characteristic of the uh, characteristics of the device. This is the reason why they are called the friction. They have been called the, at the beginning friction pendulum because actually there is a pendulum, uh, the motion of a pendulum uh, associated to uh, and applied to the structural system. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, can I ask a question? In the, yes. Uh, during design stage, do engineers usually assume friction coefficient to be constant? Because I know there are other models, yeah. model friction, but I mean in, in a design practice, not a research world. Yeah, yeah, this is a very good question. Thank you, because uh, this is, uh, and uh, it opens uh, actually the, the topics uh, for another short course, maybe, <laughs> because there, is, there are a number of issues related to friction coefficient. But uh, I can say that related to practice, uh, Generally, the friction coefficient uh, is considered constant within uh, a certain uh, analysis, but uh, what is also allowed from a standard code is uh, to perform bound analysis. So this means that uh, you consider constant value of friction coefficient within a single analysis, for instance, uh, a nonlinear time history analysis, 
but then uh, you perform uh, a number of uh, additional analysis by varying the friction coefficient because maybe you have the variation induced by the vertical load rather than the variation due to the cyclic effect because uh, uh, if there are um, and there is actually the, the heating flux originated uh, within the, uh, the sliding interfaces uh, the friction coefficient decreases uh, but you have also uh, you, you can also have a decreasing value an increasing value of a friction coefficient due to the uh, a higher value of uh, sliding velocity so you can account for them with a constant friction coefficient but by performing a number of additional um, additional uh, analysis by varying the uh, the numerical value this is generally what is done in real practice because uh, uh, in real practice uh, generally uh, there are no very detailed models uh, in commercial softwares, uh, especially. So what um, uh, the result, the main result is that uh, a practitioner uh, should uh, allow to uh, consider exactly the same behavior, but uh, just by, uh, by using a very simplified uh, tools. And one of them could be maybe uh, to consider also bound analysis and so to vary the constant friction coefficient, but according to uh, the uh, realistic behavior of the devices. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah, the friction coefficient, I think that is uh, the most, um, uh, let's say, uncertain parameter that we have uh, for isolation devices, uh, but just um, generally for the VAVO point of view. But uh, nowadays, uh, um, standard codes uh, and models uh, are very updated uh, so that even though we can we have we can just consider a constant friction coefficient uh, the final result uh, with bound analysis can be fairly uh, fair enough uh, actually to provide uh, a realistic representation of the overall system and these are the typologies that they, um, that, that uh, can be found uh, in a real practice. So the um, uh, depending on the number actually of uh, um, sliding surfaces, uh, we have uh, here a single curved surface slider, and uh, you uh, you see there are two actually two sliding surfaces. And uh, so why it is called a single curved surface slider? Well, just because of the the first uh, sliding surface as uh, a radius of curvature which is much higher than the second one. So uh, these uh, R1 and this is R2. So R1 is much higher than R2. And consequently, in the overall motion, uh, the uh, governing uh, uh, sliding surface is the first one. Okay, so the, the uh, sliding surface with the uh, the maximum uh, radius of curvature is the one which rules the motion. Rather than the second typology, which is the double curved surface slider with non-articulated slider, you see that there is uh, uh, there are actually two uh, surface slider, um, I mean, uh, sliding surfaces. Uh, they, they are named uh, here one. So this means that they have uh, actually exactly the same radius of curvature but they could be also with different uh, radius of curvature if uh, uh, the, um, uh, we, with the also a non-articulated slider. Non-articulated means that this is just a unique steel block, okay? And uh, uh, it is different than this one, which is the double concave, uh, concave or co curved surface slider device with the articulated slider. So here you see, this is a, something like a hinge which allows the relative rotation between the two portions of the inner slider. And again, especially for this typology of device, the two radius of curve, the two radii of curvature could be different. And also the friction coefficient could be different. And the final one is like the one I've shown with the one meter displacement capacity of my Professor Michael Costantino, which is a, a multi-stage curved surface slider device. So with multiple sliding surfaces, uh, I think that the maximum is the quintuple uh, friction pendulum system, which has been uh, designed and actually studied in research from uh, Professor Costantino. Uh, which has uh, actually the largest number of uh, uh, surface uh, sliding surfaces. 
And uh, uh, you see, yeah, you can imagine that there are applications, uh, there could be also applications with uh, a larger number of uh, uh, internal sliding surfaces, uh, but uh, there is uh, always the, the problem of uh, residual displacements, uh, which are uh, actually one key issue uh, of uh, um, sliding devices, uh, because sliding devices have a huge nonlinear behavior. And uh, generally, there are issues uh, also related to the installation, uh, the installation of these uh, devices, uh, because uh, this is uh, you can see that this is actually a single um, a single uh, curve uh, curved device, uh, which is actually installed uh, in a different way from the first figure to the second one. And uh, there are implications uh, uh, within the structural response uh, um, according to these uh, two assumptions, uh, because uh, actually. Uh, according to this definition, uh, the overall vertical reaction force uh, and actually the vertical load uh, is uh, aligned uh, with respect to the uh, the uh, hinge, uh, which is this one. Okay, so if it moves uh, like here, because it slides, the uh, application is uh, always uh, uh, applied uh, along this line. So there is no changing uh, uh, with respect to the application of the vertical force uh, with respect to the superstructure, but there is a change, a changing uh, actually with respect to the uh, substructure because we have uh, this uh, new location, uh, we have uh, this distance. So there is a moment uh, induced, uh, uh, a second ordinary moment. Uh, induced by this uh, vertical reaction. And uh, in this uh, uh, application, uh, it is exactly uh, the opposite. Uh, so this means that the uh, reaction, the vertical reaction is always aligned with respect to the hinge, okay? So if uh, the hinge moves here, the, uh, actually everything moves there. So this means that it will be here. So now the lever arm is here. And so the second moment uh, will be applied to the superstructure and not to the uh, substructure. So it, uh, um, the uh, effect, uh, internal effect, uh, the local effects uh, of uh, sliding devices uh, could be different depending on the topology of the device uh, and also depending on the installation uh, that we consider for the, uh, for the final device. Concerning the modeling assumptions, uh, we can consider two, the superposition of two contributions, uh, the uh, frictionally static response uh, and the, the linear uh, recentering force response. Uh, the frictionally static response uh, can be just considered as a, a rigid plastic behavior, hysteretic behavior. So we have uh, the gray area, which is actually the hysteresis area. So uh, we know now that uh, hysteresis area means uh, dissipation of energy. And uh, the uh, linear recentering force uh, can be modeled as a linear spring uh, with respect to horizontal displacements. And this is just because uh, uh, of the shape, uh, the spherical shapes uh, of the uh, sliding surfaces. Uh, the uh, applied vertical force uh, is uh, stepwise projected uh, along the tangent line um, to, with respect to the uh, shape. Uh, of the of the uh, surface, so this means that uh, this results uh, into approximately into a linear contribution. So this is uh, uh, actually uh, something related to the recentering behavior of this particular device. So finally, this will be the uh, the final um, the final behavior of the device. Uh, so it is actually a rigid plastic with hardening uh, behavior, hysteresis is, is loop. Here there is uh, an expression uh, actually related to the friction, uh, to the friction response. Uh, generally we find uh, in the literature the sign of the velocity, but uh, I will show you that there is another uh, function uh, which can be uh, much more, um, uh, useful, I mean, uh, uh, for the representation of the um, of the overall frictional behavior of these devices, uh, especially when we have to uh, time integrate uh, some uh, uh, some system, a simplified system, for instance, for a single degree of freedom, uh, of freedom oscillator. 
And uh, this is an exa exactly the same example uh, I've shown for the recycled rubber bearing. Uh, this is for a prototype that we have designed uh, at the U Center Foundation. But I have to click on the video. It doesn't work. I don't know why, but uh, I will show it uh, later on. But it is exactly, it shows uh, actually the. Uh, I show the video here. You see, this is a video of a an experimental test, and uh, the force displacement loop is actually the one, uh, the experimental one. So you see that there is a rigid branch, initial branch, also related to the unloading branch when uh, we uh, change direction uh, during the test. And then we have the steel resistor, which is directly related to the frictional motion. So these are examples of full scale applications. And this is actually a steel silo, which has been tested on the shake table at the Central Laboratory. Uh, you will see that this is uh, the fixed base configuration. There are uh, there is the plate at the at the base uh, of the of the silos, which is uh, actually restrained from the horizontal point of view. And uh, now it starts moving. You see that the base is fixed, and then, uh, so this means that the overall the overall uh, motion is transferred uh, also with no restrictions. I mean uh, uh, to the superstructure. And uh, it was actually filled uh, with grain. So this means that uh, there, there is also something, uh, a sort of a dynamic excitation, internal dynamic excitation to motion. OK, and this is with, you see that the base is, has been unrestrained. So this, uh, and uh, below there are four uh, sur uh, curved surface sliders. And then I will show another video, local video of the device. You see that now, the base can move with respect to the shake table. And uh, consequently, the overall uh, uh, response of the silos is lowered uh, and then uh, the uh, counterpart with the fixed base configuration. And according to this test, uh, let's see another view of the same test, which is actually a local view um, on the shake table. So this means that we will see actually the single isolator, which is a single curved surface slider. The camera is actually located on the shake, at the shake table. So we will see the base exactly fixed. And we will see the top part of the bearing, which will, be, will move. And you see that, again, there is the hinge below. So the the vertical force is applied exactly at the beginning, uh, at the center of the device. And then you will notice, OK, now it starts. You see everything moves at the top part. There is the pendulum, uh, the pendulum motion. And also the, you, you can also notice the rotation of the, of the hinge uh, during motion. So this was actually uh, the. Uh, the motion of a single device uh, during the previous test uh, that, that I've shown. And finally, just to conclude this presentation uh, for today, uh, these are just examples for structural retrofit. Uh, base isolation uh, is not, is not uh, useful only for uh, new design, but uh, there are a number of uh, companies uh, which provide the design of retrofit uh, applications uh, for vulnerable uh, systems. And actually, this is uh, uh, one typology of uh, retrofit. So you consider just columns, uh, which are um, directly cut in the middle. And then uh, they are uh, uplifted uh, with uh, um, a special uh, setup uh, with the jacks, uh, with hydraulic jacks. Uh, and then uh, the isolators are placed uh, uh, in between. And actually, they are placed uh, in the middle of columns because uh, um, the middle of column uh, is uh, the um, location where is expected the moment is expected uh, uh, the flexion of moment is expected to be uh, the lowest, uh, actually uh, near to zero uh, according to um, to general generally seismic design. 
And these are, now I will show another typology of retrofit, which is especially considered for uh, historical, um, historical um, buildings. There is the audio, uh, I hope you will, uh, uh, you will be able to, uh, to listen. Uh, otherwise, just let me know. Now it starts. Doctor, is it ex expected to have voice or so? Because yeah, there should be. Uh, there is a voice uh, talking now. Uh, uh, can you no. hear? Uh, no, no, no. You, okay. So I will. Uh, I will describe uh, because uh, maybe it, it doesn't work. So this is an application, and there are actually now a number of companies uh, which can do this. Uh, actually, the main uh, strategy is to cast a reinforced concrete plate at the base by by excavating a portion of the uh, of the soil um, in the um, uh, in the internal part of the building you see there is uh, the detailing of the reinforcements uh, and then there are uh, locations where uh, you will need to to have empty spaces uh, in order to install uh, the new isolation and then you do exactly the same also in the external part of the building in order to provide uh, actually the plate, uh, which is uh, the first foundation of the building. And again, uh, you place reinforcements uh, and then uh, you cast concrete. Uh, and in order to have uh, a base uh, on which uh, the uh, final system uh, will be laid. Okay, so th that will be the uh, very first foundation uh, with respect to the soil. Then we go back into the building now uh, as the as the video goes uh, goes by. We have to drill some holes uh, in order to provide some uh, additional uh, rebars uh, because now we have to cast another um, reinforced concrete plate, which will be actually the base of the building, and uh, actually it will be the interface between the building and uh, the isolation system again the reinforcements uh, and casting of concrete and uh, uh, in this plate uh, and the same also for the external part uh, obviously and uh, within uh, this uh, uh, second plate uh, there are some raising points uh, where uh, we have to place uh, hydraulic jacks uh, you see that uh, this uh, particular tube uh, is actually um, uh, restrained with respect to the very first plate, which provides actually a reaction with respect to the application of vertical force. Then uh, this uh, system of uh, anchoring uh, uh, of the hydraulic jacks provides actually the uh, lifting, the uplifting of the overall, uh, the overall building. There are a number smeared uh, among uh, the uh, among the surface uh, of the of the uh, building, and uh, within the control room, uh, there everything is uh, numerically controlled. Uh, actually, the uh, response of the hydraulic jacks, so that uh, you can uh, uplift the overall building. Uh, the um, uh, I mean, constantly, averagely, constantly. The rate is very low. I mean, a uh, uh, tenth of uh, uh, one tenth of a millimeter uh, every minute. So this means that uh, you uh, you uh, keep uh, hours uh, hours uh, to lift uh, uh, the overall building. But this is very useful to not to have damage uh, in the overall uh, superstructure. Once it is uplifted, the building you can place. Uh, within those holes uh, for installation, uh, uh, all the isolation devices. Uh, and then they can be fixed uh, between the very first plate uh, and the second one, which, is, which has been anchored uh, through the uh, holes uh, and the rebars uh, that we have placed. 
So once they have been installed, we have exactly a base isolated building, uh, even if the uh, the overall, the overall, I mean, uh, uh, technology is uh, an old uh, building, uh, maybe masonry building, uh, with which is very vulnerable with respect to seismic actions. And you see, the this is uh, in a in a in a some way uh, actually uncoupled with respect to the ground motion, and the overall internal forces can be uh, uh, can be decreased. So this is again another simulation. And uh, uh, it looks like uh, something magic, uh, but uh, they are, there are a number nowadays of company uh, which can provide these, uh, these studies. And uh, uh, actually there is uh, this lifting shift, uh, system uh, which can be done uh, uh, for most part of uh, the uh, historical, uh, of the historical uh, structural systems. Well, I think that, that we are done. Um, ex exactly in time because it's uh, four o'clock. Um, is there any question of uh, what we, ha we have seen? Uh, it's not about what we see, to be honest, but uh, can you tell me how can we find the, uh, the uh, records of this lecture? Because it's recorded. Yeah, it's recorded, uh, but um, it will be uh, provided at the end of the short course. Yes. Yeah, okay. No, no problem. Uh, through, uh, obviously, uh, through the um, um, the shared folder uh, of Google Drive. So um, I think uh, within uh, one hour, I will uh, provide you th this first lecture uh, and uh, also some uh, useful file uh, that we will use uh, in, uh, later, in later lectures. Perfect, thank you very okay. much. Okay, you're welcome. So if there is no other questions, uh, I think that uh, we can, uh, uh, we can proceed and then tomorrow for the next lecture. And uh, tomorrow we will see uh, the main characteristics of the standard code for uh, testing uh, uh, anti-seismic devices. Uh, so the European standard code, uh, which is uh, the uh, UNI EN 15129, uh, the version of 2009, which uh, now it is uh, in revision, uh, but um, actually the one which is actually used nowadays uh, is uh, the version of 2009. And uh, we will prepare us uh, to perform some computations uh, on, uh, um, on actually the uh, realistic data, experimental data on the numerical laboratory on, on Wednesday afternoon. Okay, so see you tomorrow and uh, uh, enjoy the, uh, the, uh, the night. Thank, Thank you very much. See you. See you. Bye, guys. See you. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye -bye. Professor. Have a nice Thank day. You. Have a good day. You too.